Hello, and thank you for joining us today. We're going to be looking in depth in Tacoma Banking, studying kind of a deep dive into the time period of 1873 to 1893, which I've dubbed successes and failures, and in this case, more successes than failures. For those of you who don't know me, I worked for 20 years for the Tacoma Public Library, and it was very much a time of learning for me how to use computers, how to do research, I got to practice storytelling. Uh, it was a really exciting background for me, but I left that to continue research um, on Tacoma's early Jewish community. But instead, I got involved with Tacoma Historical Society as a volunteer. We created some books that were 21 tales that ended up being a series. I got to continue learning, researching exhibits and uh, listening to stories as people came in. And I got more and more excited about Tacoma's history. And through it all, I was intrigued by the 1893 banking panic. And that led to research on the banking history of Tacoma, which is a current exhibit. And we're gonna look at just the early part of that today. Well, it's always difficult for me to say without a doubt that something was first. I always want to hedge my bets a little bit and say, well, we think the first or maybe the first. But in this case, we're pretty certain. This guy named Clinton Ferry had come to Tacoma and had started business in the early 1870s. And he was documenting those firsts as a correspondent for the Portland Oregonian. So in July of 1873, he reported that the very first bank had opened actually just in the corner of a store at the mill uh, on the wharf in Tacoma. Well, that story was picked up and printed in newspapers around the Northwest. And by the time it made it to Bozeman, Montana in September of 1873, the Cook Brothers Bank had already closed because their uncle, Jay Cook, had failed. And that failure stopped Tacoma's growth. Now, technically, it's not called a failure. They closed it. They knew it was coming. So they were able to call in their loans and they were able to return <clears throat> deposits to every single depositor. That is not a pattern that we're going to see repeated in Tacoma's history. Um, that is highly unusual for a, a bank to close and fail and the depositors to get their money back. Well, I'm going to digress just a little bit about who the Cook brothers were, because if you tell me that somebody is somebody's nephew, my background in genealogy wants me to figure out exactly who. And because the last name was Cook, it made sense that they were sons of Pitt Cook and Pitt was a brother of Jay. But more importantly, their mother was Mary Townsend. And those of you who know me also know that I am an advocate for not just telling his story, but for telling her story. And I think that Mary Townsend's story has been left out. Her father was William Townsend. And William Townsend and L. Uterus Cook have a unique history in the far-flung town of Sandusky, Ohio, up on the shores of Lake Erie. They were founders. They were pioneers of that area. And they chartered the Mad River and Lake Erie Railroad in 1832. So in the very, very early days of Ohio, they were connecting Lake Erie through transportation to the east. And it's something that their children would continue to do. Uh, both of the Townsend parents died in the 1849 cholera epidemic. And Mary Townsend had married Pitt Cook. And she committed to arranging marriages for her sisters to see that her orphan sisters were not left out, uh, that they were cared for. And it is logical that she would arrange marriages for them to men in her circle, in her husband's circle. And so you'll see at the bottom that Louisa Townsend married Theodore Hosmer, Susan Townsend married Charles Wright, and we don't know the name Gilman Pritchard as well, but he was also here in Tacoma. But what this tells us was that these four women in the Townsend family were united through marriage. And it was those marriages to Wright and Hosmer and Cook who formed the core of the officers of the Northern Pacific Railroad. So that is why those two young men banking in Tacoma were an important story, important part of Tacoma's early history because it connects not only Cook, but Wright and Hosmer. Well, let's go back to Jay Cook and banking. He was not afraid of risk. He was not afraid of failure. He helped support the union during the Civil War, came up with a plan for selling government bonds. Now, how do you think he got that idea? Because that's how Cook and Townsend had funded the earlier railroad. 
used that same method after the war to raise capital for his railroad. However, by the 1870s, that railroad was so overextended that his company failed. Now, as we go through this, we're gonna kind of add to our list of ways to fail. There's ways to leave your lover and there's ways to fail your bank. And one of them is if your funding fails, your sponsor fails in this case. Not only did Jay Cook fail, that caused a nationwide depression, it was part of that, but it stalled Tacoma's growth. And if you look at the big story in Tacoma in 1873, we like to brag that it's, we were selected as the terminus of the Northern Pacific Railroad, but nothing happened until 1880s because our growth was stalled because of Jay Cook's failure. So again, banking is an important part of Tacoma's history. So in 1880, we finally got a bank. It was started by William Blackwell. Well, he wasn't a banker. He was a hotel guy for the railroad. And Dr. Bostick was clearly a physician. And Andrew Baker did have some banking history. Now, to give you an idea of what life was like in Tacoma, Mr. Baker kept his horse in a stable behind the bank. And civic groups were excited to have a two-story building. So they used the room upstairs, but they had to come in through an exterior staircase so that the bank downstairs could be secure. And the kind of things that were important in newspaper articles, when the new safe arrived on a ship from San Francisco in 1883, that was a big item in the newspaper. It was also important when the bank became one of the city's first subscribers to a telephone system. And as quickly as it came, away it went. William Blackwell, one of the partners, left the bank in 1883 to start a competing bank. Okay, that's not a good sign. That's not an indication that it was a peaceful split. So what did Andrew Banker do? Well, he sold part of his interest to these guys, Thompson and Kaufman, and we'll come back to them. By 1884, he sold out completely. His health was failing, so he went to Europe. Unfortunately, he died there in 1888. So Thompson and Kaufman reorganized that bank. Now, we do lots of changing of names in our banking history, and usually for a reason. This one, what do you think? It was called the Bank of New Tacoma. Now, why would the Bank of New Tacoma in 1884 need a new name? Because Old Tacoma and New Tacoma had just merged and we were just Tacoma. So they could have just dropped the Bank of Tacoma, but instead they chose to become the Merchants National Bank. So this article talks about the Bank of New Tacoma is to be succeeded by the merchants. So it didn't fail, it succeeded in a way that we'll become accustomed to through name changes. But the Bank of New Tacoma no longer existed. So another way to fail is when your partners divide, especially when they compete. Now, why did Blackwell leave the bank? Because he started his own bank right next door. In this picture, you'll see that little wooden building that was the Bank of New Tacoma. And next to it is the Tacoma National Bank. And in 1883, they called it of New Tacoma. It was started by William Blackwell, part of the hotel group for the Northern Pacific, and General John Wilson Sprague, also connected with the Northern Pacific Railway. We have spent more hours studying this picture than we probably should admit, um, but you'll see the bank on the corner. And just to the right of it is the new post office that opened about the time the bank did. And upstairs at the eastern side of it is the uh, photography studio of Jackson. And all the way at the back, those tall chimneys on that three-story building, that's the Tacoma Hotel, also Northern Pacific Railroad. One of the things we love about this building is that the entrance is on the corner. And that established something that in Tacoma became a tradition. Banks like to be on the corner. They didn't want to use an address of 1302. They'd say 13th and. And the entrance of the door was physically on an angle on the corner. That bank succeeded, did well. And in 1888, they were able to double their size. And how did they do that? Well, by tearing down that old wooden building that had been the Banker Bank, doubled the size of their building. Unfortunately, that building today is a parking lot on the corner of South 10th and Pacific. Uh, just south of the Provident Building. That bank also failed. Sprague also withdrew from that partnership in 1889. Blackwell continued on his own for a while, but on his own, he was not able to survive 
1893 banking panic, and they failed on July 24th. So the panic of 1893 becomes way number one for banks to fail, beginning with Black Friday on May 5th, nothing to do with the shopping. Um, and that banking panic is the topic of a whole nother talk. Um, today, we're gonna focus just on the individual banks and how they responded to that. Well, you might think that a practical and common way to fail in the Northwest would be a fire. We have streets lined with wooden buildings. We have fires all the time. That was true for the Tacoma Savings Bank. It was started by Wilson and Welfrey. Both of them had been just tellers in a bank, didn't really have a lot of money, opened up in March of 84, and by Easter, the entire block had burned out. Uh, they were located where Frost Park is now. So they immediately popped across the street to where the Smart Park is now, the Fife Corner, and that was burned out in July of 1884. So by the end of the year, Mr. Wilson said, I've had enough of this. He went on his way. Wilfred continued on his own for a little bit, but he just didn't have the backing and the finances he needed, and he had to close. And this is why there were rumors of frailty. It's like, do they really have enough money? And what happened was people started withdrawing their deposits. Anyone who's seen Mary Poppins knows about a run on the bank and how that can happen. And it makes sense. You have a, few, a little bit of money deposited. You have a little money loaned out but you don't have a lot of money on hand. And if there is a run and people start asking for the deposits, you simply don't have it available. We also discovered in the closure of that bank that the bank had been started with stock pledges. Now to me, stock pledges are basically IOUs. Oh yeah, I'll put in 5,000, I'll put in 5,000. So we can say we have $10,000 in stock. We did not have the little word that said paid in. It was pledged stock because they owned other properties or values that would support it. And that is something we saw over and over in the Northwest in Tacoma specifically is the stock pledges for starting the banks. They were IOUs. They were not paid in cash. Well, when they first looked at the book, they thought maybe they'd been embezzling. So willfully immediately split for Canada, hung out in Victoria for a while, ended up back in banking in Denver. Uh, Wilson, however, stayed in Tacoma. He um, adjusted all of the um, challenges. As Hunt says, he faced that music. Um, and he was able to continue in banking and preserve his good name. So another way to fail, of course, is a natural disaster. But we're also going to look at how your initial stock and pledges could be a problem. And again, this one was when your partners divide. So that's a triple whammy for them. Now I said I would come back to the Merchants National Bank. It was formed by Walter Thompson, Henry Drum, uh, Kaufman, and Davis. Kaufman eventually left and started his own bank in Chehalis, and the Kaufman Bank was there for decades. But these men had come to Tacoma from Nebraska, and they were going to start their own bank. But when they realized what was going on with Baker, um, they just bought controlling interest in that bank, and that worked for them without having to start their own. However, as the 80s went on, they moved across the street and they moved into the first three-story building in Tacoma known as the We Met block, like we met before. And as banking goes, they did a really smart thing. They bought that building in February of 1885 for a whopping $16,000. And in just five years, they were able to sell it back to the original builder for $50,000. That's how real estate is supposed to work. And why do they want to sell their building? Because they were building their own across the street. This time a substantial building where they would have bank offices below, they would have um, other offices above providing re rental income for them to pay for that building. So for two years, the funds of the bank were tied up in construction of this building. They also followed the big boom in Tacoma at that time as real estate was booming in the late 1880s, the early 1890s. So the majority of their loans were issued on real estate. So when the 1893 banking panic happened, the first bank in the state of Washington to fail was what we thought was a very strong, very stable Merchants National Bank. Because a bank in New York asked for $100,000 that had been invested and they were unable to just magically make $100,000 appear, and they had to fail. Because their assets were in real estate that didn't have value, 
the people who were trying to solve the problems of the closure by 1897 had only been able to get back to depositors less than 18 cents on the dollar. So Tacoma's real estate and economy was in deep distress for many years. So a big way to fail is the 1893 banking panic. And this opens up a whole wealth of things, but your real estate loans and the banking panic. Now, one of the banks that I love was hearing about the Tacoma Buildings and Savings. It opened in 1887, and one of the first things they did was hire a female architect. Her name was Kate Lockwood. We think the first architect, female architect, to practice in the state of Washington. And it was a building and savings. So it also worked in development. So the officers of this building and savings would purchase lots, often from their own officers, and um, sell homes to people who would then work with Kate Lockwood and she would look at architectural plans, adjust them for them. The bank would oversee construction and at the end of construction would hand over the keys. However, by 1890, they were able to buy the brand new Tacoma Theater building from the investors who built that. And the secretary cashier named Linus Post kind of got a little more involved with the theater than he was in supervising construction and running his banking. He headed back east to try to come up with some more money and told his wife he was on his way home, but never showed up. So he was gone for a long, long time. He finally showed up in 1912 in China. With him gone, what do we do? Well, East Coast, they're still involved. So this was even before the banking panic. So this guy named George Vanderbilt from back east decides that he'll buy a controlling stock in this. And what that does is gives his nephew, Philip Vanderbilt Caesar, a job lets him be president of a bank. And we often see that investors and banks do that so that their sons or nephews can have a career, help them get on their way. So in April of 1893, with the sort of drama over Linus Post disappearing, they renamed the Metropolitan Savings Bank. And when the 1893 banking panic, the deep pockets of the Vanderbilt family got the bank through the 1893 panic. Well, how did we recover from that panic? A lot of it was the gold rush in, Cal in Alaska. So in 1897, the officers of the bank invested heavily in transportation to Alaska. However, they spent a little more than they should. So there was yet another run on the bank in May of 1898. And again, Vanderbilt loaned $300,000 and reorganized the bank as the Metropolitan Bank now, all they did was drop the word savings, but that gave them a name change and legally they could go from one to the other, kind of like we see in bankruptcies today. But as a result of that, they did give up the Tacoma Theater Building and that went back to the insurance company. He moved to 1302 Pacific in a building that Vanderbilt owned and we'll see why. And there was yet another run on the bank in November of 1901. And for a third time, Mr. Vanderbilt came to Tacoma's rescue. He advanced $600,000 because the school children's saving program was invested in the Metropolitan Bank. And the article in the paper in December said that this was Vanderbilt's Christmas present to Tacoma, that the children were all going to get the money back from their savings account. And because of him, Metropolitan Bank paid their depositors in full. Again, an exception to the rule. So technically, this bank didn't fail. It was bailed out. And as one banking officer told me last fall, it wasn't the bank that was bailed out. It was the depositors who were bailed out and received a full refund on their deposits. The one that didn't work that way was the Tacoma Trust and Savings. And often people just called it Tacoma Savings. It was organized in May of 1887 by some of the same officers who started the Merchants Bank. And I don't understand the full logistics of this, but so often banks started a separate bank just to handle their trust business. And as laws changed, those would come and go. But with 1893 banking panic, they were in trouble. So they tried changing their name. February of 1894, let's be the Bank of Tacoma. They tried absorbing another bank, let's work together. In March of 1894, they absorbed the Imperial Loan and Trust. But I don't think they realized what bad shape that was in and it didn't really help them. So by August of 1895, they assigned their assets to their creditors, said, 
this is what we owe, this is what we don't owe, we're out of it. Well, the cash on hand was less than $500. The debts were nearly 400,000 and nearly a quarter million of that was in city deposits. So the city of Tacoma had just lost nearly a quarter million dollars from their piggy bank. So let's look at how you fail in 1893 through 1895. The real estate loans are bad. You can't collect on those stock pledges. We discover that bank officers had made loans to themselves or their friends. Now that's illegal, but in those days it was common. And that was something that the receivers sometimes identified as embezzling. You can't just loan yourself money. And then something happened that I had never heard of before receivers made assessments on the stockholders. So imagine you buy shares of stock in a company at $10 a share. You think that as soon that stock is gonna be worth $20 a share and you'll have doubled your money. But instead that company fails and your $10 of a share in your stock has no value whatsoever. And in fact, it becomes a liability. And the receivers of the company file an assessment on you and they tell you, you now owe $1 on every share of stock, that you have to pay them in addition to your original purchase. And then a couple years later, there's an additional assessment of $2 a share. In the early 1900s, these shareholders and the attorneys were still in court, trying to settle those cases, trying to collect on claims, trying to pay those assessments to reimburse those depositors from long ago. And finally, those receivers come in and they identify what becomes questionable Tacoma city deposits in the form of warrants. Now it's difficult for me to talk about what happened without swearing. So I have some images that kind of imply some of the euphemisms you might talk about when there's trouble. Um, Bruce Ramsey described it really well in his Panic of 1893. He said that he used a Warren Buffett quote, that only when the tide goes out do you discover who's been swimming naked. So in 1893, when these banks are failing, it does expose financial crimes. There's also a real driving need to arrest somebody. Somebody has to pay. How could these banks fail and take my money and, and, and nobody's going to jail for it? Right? Well, somebody did go to jail. And it was a city treasurer, George Box. We uh, tried over and over and over again to arrest bank officers, and each time the claim, the charge was that they knowingly received deposits even though they knew that the bank was failing. Well, that's a catch-22. The only way the bank can keep going is if you keep getting more deposits. And if you stop getting deposits because you're in trouble, you're, you're not gonna get out of trouble. So it was also, though, very frustrating for people who learned that they had deposited thousands of dollars in a bank at 10 o'clock in the morning and at five o'clock on that day, the bank announced that they were failing. Those successes to put them in jail and in prison had been unsuccessful. So enter city treasurer, George Boggs. He was elected in November of 1890, narrowly reelected, served through April of 1894, and then was replaced by his handpicked replacement. He funded city finances through 1893 by a creative process, not only of government bonds, but by depositing what were voided city warrants. Now a bond is due at a particular time. A warrant is like an IOU. I'll write you a check, but don't cash that check until I say it's okay for you to do that. Well, no, that cash isn't good at my bank anymore. So here, I'll give you the money back for that check, that warrant. He'd mark them unpaid insufficient funds, but then he would take those basically canceled voided checks and deposit them in banks as if they were cash. And those voided city warrants became the heart of the problem of the city of Tacoma's downfall. He was first arrested in November of 1894 for embezzling when the state bank failed. But his lawyers were really good. And they said, well, it's insufficient evidence. You can't arrest somebody based on the books that someone else kept. These aren't his books. He didn't commit a crime. He was arrested again in October of 1895. And this always reminds me of how um, Al Capone was arrested for uh, tax evasion. He was charged with personally receiving interest on city deposits. 
And apparently there was a custom that if um, your bank was going to get the sweet deposits from the city, that a little bit of the interest might go into uh, Treasurer Boggs' private account. Um, in, yeah, in those days, the term for that, um, he would have been called a boodler. Um, yes, taking a little contribution on the side. He was successfully tried. He was sentenced to serve six years at the Walla Walla Penitentiary, and off he went. Fought it a long time, but he finally went. Well, he had really strong support in Tacoma. And by a couple of years after this, people started feeling kind of sorry for him. He had a wife and kids. He was a nice guy. He was the only one who went to prison. Did he really do anything wrong? So they tried to get the governor to pardon him. And the governor said, well, pardon is for, like if somebody accidentally did something or if they got drunk or lost their temper. But this guy was a civil servant. He knowingly had the trust of the public funds and he knowingly, they felt cheated that. So the governor wouldn't give him a pardon. Well, his supporters looked around the country and they found out that in Michigan, there was this system called parole. And they were able to push legislation through to the state of Washington to create a parole system. And Boggs just happened to qualify for the guidelines of that parole. He had already served a year of his sentence. He was convicted of a crime that was less than murder, just a petty crime. And he had powerful people willing to testify that they would provide a job for him and speak to his character. So he was paroled in June of 1899, and the state of Washington owes the early days of its parole system to city treasurer George Box. Another bank that was really exciting in Tacoma was the Union Savings Bank and Trust Company. Uh, that was formed in 1890, and the building was built by Walter Waddell Sr. Now there's a little confusion on some of the history talks around here because his son was hired as a clerk. And again, many bank, many successful men um, invested in banks so that their nephews or sons could begin a banking career. And in this case, Walter Waddell did not lose his bank. He did not have to go work for his bank. He invested purposely in the bank so that his son, Walter Jr., could work in the bank. However, in 1893, the bank president was Sprague, and Sprague died. So Waddell sold that bank building and went on to other investments. The bank did fail in 1897. And why? Because of the validity of those city warrants. The money they had deposited, those voided checks were not real money and they didn't have actual money to return to them. They could give the warrants back, but not that amount of money. And at that time, the Union Bank held a quarter of a million dollars in warrants. So again, the city with this $5 million in debt had lost over a million dollars that was in Tacoma's banks. And it was the rush for the demand for that money back that caused more and more banks to fail. The one good part of this story is the Waddell building because that building still stands in Tacoma. If you go up and down 10th and 11th, 12th, 13th in Tacoma, every single one of those early bank buildings are gone. But if you work your way all the way down to the corner of 15th and Pacific, the Waddell building is still there. Now it's a story shorter than it used to be. It's lost some of that rooftop ornamentation. And actually, we only have two exterior walls, but it is still there. And I believe it is Tacoma's oldest remaining bank building. So we focus on that strong stuff. Okay, focusing on strong stuff, which banks survived? Well, there were four, as opposed to the 20 or so who failed. Four. One was a Pacific National Bank chartered in 1885, a key time in Tacoma's history. And by eight, two years later, had offices in the new Chamber of Commerce building on 12th and Pacific. And many of you remember that once upon a time, the goddess of commerce was up on top of that building. In 1890, they built the six-story building on 13th and Pacific for a whopping $70,000. That building was later renamed the Luzon building. That's why it perks up our ears. And in 1892, they sold it to that same George Vanderbilt for $165,000. That is one of the keys to their success during that time. Not only did they recoup um, their investment on their building, but they had just sold their building and were renting when the stock market crashed. That allowed them in 1895 
to merge peacefully and absorb the assets of the Citizens National Bank. And they also were able to move into a prime corner on 11th and Pacific that had been occupied by the Merchants Bank. So again, they were renting during a time uh, instead of losing on their real estate. And in 1905, a significant consolidation with Lumberman's Bank it was actually started as Scandinavian. And that allowed them to continue until another really friendly merger in 1913. And that was with the National Bank of Commerce. Now we're partial to this bank at Tacoma Historical Society because one of the treasures in our collection is items from a trunk that belonged to the Wade family. Um, interior pictures of staff members, including an African American. I mean, so rarely do you see that, but also the detail of the interior of the building, um, clothing, um, journals that were handwritten by J.C. Weatherett as he described his feelings in the 1880s as to what was going on. He, he um, was very unhappy for days and days while they were waiting. Once the safe was arrived, that two-story safe that was up here, once that safe arrived, they had to plaster it in and then they had to wait for the plaster to dry before they could open the bank. In 1893 though, they were kind of voted out of their own bank. Chester Thorne took over. Um, the bank did survive through that panic and in 1913 merged with the bank we just talked about, Pacific National Bank, to form the National Bank of Tacoma. A third bank to survive during that time was Fidelity Trust. Um, this is where the Woolworth building was. And if you're coming up into the farmer's market, you'll see this in the right as you come up from the south. It was originally built with five stories and later they added stories on top of it. Uh, and had some money from uh, Oregon, Baker, Ainsworth, Wallace, um, but also had deposits from the Northern Pacific Railroad during this time. And that's credited with getting them through that. In 1919, that bank was acquired by the Bank of California. Again, a very stable time in Tacoma's history. The fourth bank to survive, I don't have to tell you, was Puget Sound Savings Bank. Anyone who's lived here for any length of time has heard of Puget Sound. Started in 1890 um, on 24th and Pacific and uh, several rented locations, never really built its own building in the early days. That helped it survive the 1893 panic. But in March of 1894, they refused to pay interest on those city warrants. And Boggs got mad and he withdrew all of the city deposits from their bank. Well, it wasn't that much money to begin with, but not having that crisis was one factor that helped them survive this difficult time. And before we leave our banking successes and failures, there's one Fabulous, outstanding success. I think we've all heard the story, but it started with failure. It was the Mason Mortgage Loan Company. Yes, Alan Mason owned a bank. It was called a loan company, but it functioned as a bank. He had come here in 1883 to sell real estate, but with Stuart and Edmund Rice, he opened a loan company. Now there are a couple of things unique in the way he did business. One was that when he sold real estate, he said, I guarantee it'll go up in value. If it goes down, I'll buy it back. Well, that worked until 1893, and then it didn't, but he bought it back. The other thing he did was through his mortgage loan company, he offered guaranteed mortgages to East Coast investors. And his paperwork said, you can invest, at this time he had four millions, millions of dollars of East Coast money invested. And his contract said, if the people who are borrowing this money can't pay it, I will make their payments for them, so you are guaranteed you will not lose money. Well, he failed in March of 1894 with over $4 million in investment loans. He didn't give up. In 1910, he was still in Tacoma. He was still promoting real estate. He was still doing everything he could to promote the city. And one of those, of course, was the uh, what he called the star of destiny, hired an artist to um, write out the lines of the many, many benefits of living in Tacoma and use that to promote the, the real estate and development of a city he had grown to love. And he is honored in the Mason Plaza on North 26 and Adams on the corner of the Wheelock Library. So I thank you for joining us. Uh, as we look at the early days of Tacoma, I hope we can meet again as we look at the next century from 1893 to 1993, what I call starts, stops, and stability. <laughs>